today. So to start um, with Jane here on my immediate left, an Irish journalist, a special correspondent for PBS NewsHour in the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. She's been living in the Middle East for about 10 years. Uh, used to work for Al Jazeera. Uh, important to note that this report from Yemen that you're about to watch a clip from is a winner of the 2018 Polk Award. Um, and maybe we can take a look at that clip before we begin the conversation with Jane. Life is slipping away from Maimona Shagadar. She suffers the agony of starvation in silence. No longer able to walk or talk, at 11 years old, little Maimona's emaciated body weighs just 24 pounds. Watching over her is older brother Najib, who brought her to this remote hospital in Yemen, desperate to get help. The nurses here fight for the lives of children who are starving. Because of the war, she is suffering from malnutrition. Her father is jobless. Most of the families in Yemen are jobless. Every day, she says she sees these sorts of cases. People have lost work, therefore they've no money, therefore there's just no food in the house. You were never supposed to see these images of Maimona. A blockade of rebel-held northern Yemen stops reporters from getting here. Journalists are not allowed on flights into the area. No cameras, no pictures. The only way into rebel-held Yemen is to smuggle yourself in. And for me, that means to be dressed entirely as a Yemeni woman with a full face veil just to get through the checkpoints. I traveled across the embattled front lines to see what's actually happening inside what the United Nations is calling the world's worst humanitarian disaster. Hello. The Houthis cautiously welcomed me in, and once I was there, watched me closely. The hunger here and this human catastrophe is entirely man-made. Yemen was already one of the poorest countries in the Middle East, and the war has pushed an already needy people to the brink of famine. very tough to watch, and as you can imagine, it's much tougher to report. So Jane, maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about how you plan for a trip like that, uh, how you assess the risk, because what you did was extremely risky, and how you and how PBS NewsHour goes about thinking for preparing for a trip like that. Sure. It, this, I, I should stress that this trip is a particularly special one. It's not the kind of work that, that I or my colleagues do very often in our careers um, because the war in Yemen is so unique in the sense that it is a war that had been largely, certainly within rebel-held areas, censored from the press. The press had been kept out of covering this war and very deliberately and, and in a very organized way. So I had been trying to get in for almost two years, really. Uh, the uh, Saudi-led coalition had stopped uh, flights that were landing into Sana'a, into the capital, which is rebel-held. From they, They'd stopped them from taking journalists. They control the airspace, therefore they control the manifests of the flights, United Nations flights and humanitarian airplanes. So I had been back and forth and back and forth with a number of fixers. And this is, of course, how anybody really does their, their work when it comes to working in, in war zones. And it became apparent that the only way would be to try to smuggle our way up north. And the difficulty is, for any kind of trip like that, the biggest logistical challenge is who are you going to go with? Um, and I was fortunate enough to have been working a lot in and out of Yemen for years. So I was able to go alone, because bringing another person, nobody had really sort of smuggled themselves up yet. So we, it was an experiment. So. Uh, by going alone, I therefore hired a Yemeni team in Sana'a, a fixer, driver, cameraman, everything. So that's kind of basically how we managed it. But it took, a, it took a, a lot of planning, a lot of trial and error, and a lot of very, very careful consideration of the risks and, and how we could manage it. And, and how do you, say more about how you consider the risks, because I think you're rather methodical about it. You know, the importance of the story, the, the degree of risk, and how do you actually measure it? It's a really good question because there are risky stories all over the world. So, you know, it, 
The honest answer is that we do weigh risk up against the importance of the story in the sense of whether or not it's being told and whether or not telling this story is relevant to an American audience because the US's involvement in this war was largely unknown to the public. So, you know, you, you, but at the same time, you're also, as, as a journalist, when anybody says to you, you're banned from an area that is rather like a red flag to a bull. So, especially when that's a war. So that certainly increased my determination and also I know the determination of other journalists. So when it came to the risk we knew that, we knew what the risks were, detention, being kidnapped, you know, the, the sort of things that risks, that, that, that you would take on that road. But at the same time, I knew that if I made it in, that the impact of the reporting would be very, very important. Not just my reports, but the fact that other journalists who were trying to persuade their foreign editors to let them go would be able to say, look, she came out with 10 fingers and 10 toes can I do it now, please? <laughs> you know, I, when I worked at Human Rights Watch, uh, we often were sending people into very dangerous places. Um, and I think people often assumed that we were urging our researchers to just thrust themselves into Syria. And it was almost always the opposite, that the researchers, you know, we would have to say, no, you may not go into Chechnya. Every human rights researcher that's gone to Chechnya in the last two years has been killed. You can't go. We were constantly restraining the people in the field. When you're talking with PBS NewsHour in Washington, D.C., is that the, are you, you, you mentioned, you're the one who mentioned the bull metaphor rearing to go. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have used that language, but <laughs> um, this was a, a very special trip. I actually didn't go on commission in this particular incident. I went by myself and called my foreign editor from Sana and said, ta-da. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> That's unusual and not advised, and I don't do that very often at all. Um, but Yemen is a story that's of very deep personal importance to me. Um, but yes, what you're describing is very common in the industry. I mean, I'm not any more brave than another journalist. I'm just in a position to do that. Um, so uh, yeah, very often we are trying to persuade our bosses, and we're saying, oh, but Afghanistan wouldn't be that bad if I went this way, or you know, we'll be fine in Somalia if we do it this way. So yeah, it's very common. Like, yeah. What were the risks for the people, the Yemenis whom you did work with? How do you assess that risk? That's the most important risk to assess. Obviously, I can get out, and if something goes wrong for me, people can do their best to get me out. Um, the most important way to assess risk to the people that you're working with is post-trip, what environment are they living in? So I had people who helped me with the smuggling and they were not necessarily inside the country when that happened. So those who organized that were, not, were, were living outside of Yemen and that was important to me that they were able to to do that. Um, and those who worked with me in the north, some of them asked not to be named in things like awards entries and giving credit on social media and mentioning them. Others were happy to be named, but they were living within rebel-held areas and they were not going to be moving too much in and out of coalition-controlled areas. That's important too. But there's only so much, like we can only minimize the risk to those people we work with so much. I mean, we can't we can't eliminate the risk entirely. So, you know, we have to recognize that as well. And it's important to follow up with people after a trip to check in with them and see what their situation is and how they're doing, so. And talk about what it's like as a reporter, you know, to interview parents whose children are literally dying in front of your eyes and theirs. What, what, what is it like for the people you're interviewing and what is it like for you? Well, on a, on a technical level first, um, on a practical level, I think it's very important to remember, obviously, to treat people with an, an incredible amount of respect and patience because, and we see this everywhere, whether we're covering Yazidi victims of, of you know, sex crimes in, in, in or war crimes in Syria and, and Iraq, or whether we're covering someone whose child is dying in front of their eyes, all you can really do in a, in a situation like that is give a person an opportunity to tell their story. It's not even, I wouldn't even call it an interview in the sense that you don't push people, you don't pry, you, you, you spend time talking to people first. I mean, I might talk to someone for half an hour before the cameras go on, and then I give them an opportunity to tell me what it is that, that they want to say. 
Um, that's the best and most respectful way to deal with someone who is experiencing the worst moment of their life and there's this stranger who's there asking them questions and filming on a camera. Um, so that's, that's definitely, you know, the, the, that's the priority. On a personal level, you know, I used to think when I was younger and I was less experienced, I used to think that we are supposed to be tougher um, and, and more um, almost distant from, from our subjects. But I, I, I don't believe that and I haven't believed that for some time. Experience has taught me that we can't expect our audience to empathize with people if we don't empathize ourselves. So you have to put yourself on the line emotionally and be very vulnerable with someone and you handle that later. You can delay your human response later on when you're home and just take some time to process. And what about, I mean, you've spoken not only about the terrible experience of a parent, the trauma that they're having as their child is dying, but also the shame. And not necessarily wanting to talk about how they were unable to feed their child, which is every parent's basic responsibility. Absolutely. And this was something that I found quite striking in Yemen. And I've seen this before in other places too, but it was particular, particularly strong in Yemen. Um, and you don't realize this until you're there and you're spending time with people that there is shame. There's a huge amount of shame under the surface of a lot of emotions in war zones generally, in, you know, people who perhaps feel like they haven't been able to protect their communities and protect their families, or parents who have come, come upon the worst sort of financial catastrophe. And what I found was when I would go to hospitals, you'd go to the, the children's ward, the, the children's wards are now just basically malnutrition wards. And you talk to a parent, the first answer is always, Nothing, nothing's wrong, the child is just sick, we're absolutely fine, thank you very much. Um, and it takes time, it takes cultural awareness to understand that there's a great deal of pride and people are not going to turn to a stranger and explain immediately what has happened to them. It takes time for them to slowly tell you their story and to say, we had money, we used to be middle class, we lost all our savings, we lost all our jobs, we lost all our lines of credit, we, we don't have any food, and my children, I can't keep them alive. So there is, it takes a huge amount of vulnerability for someone to overcome the shame involved in that to talk to you. And it, it, you just have to, you have to be respectful and give them the time. You mentioned having cultural competency, and I think you studied in Yemen, studied the language, and your Arabic is fluent, and we can see some of that actually in the piece as well. But you're not Yemeni, and you're not from the region. Um, you're from Ireland. Yes. Um, and how can you talk about what it's like to be a foreigner covering this, and what it's like to be sure that you are as culturally sensitive as you need to be? I think, you know, there are varying aspects to this. I think sometimes, as a Western woman, we can get away with a little bit being considered the third sex, which can be useful in the sense that we go into situations that a Yemeni woman wouldn't by any means be able to quite as easily. Um, that's helpful. Uh, I think though, nothing compensates for living in the region. As a foreign correspondent, being someone who has lived in the Middle East for a long time, you know, learning the language, talking to people, this is something that you can't really short circuit. It takes a lot of time. Um, I was fortunate enough to have been to Yemen uh, many times, and I think that it, it takes that kind of knowledge to understand how, how people are perceiving you, because ultimately it's about empathy. It's about being able to see how they will see you coming into their lives in this moment. Um, and I think that, that that simply takes experience in, in those cultures. Did, has, have people in Yemen seen your report? Are they, are they, did, the, did any of the people that you cover ever know the way they were portrayed? Well, many middle-class Yemenis have seen it because they are, you know, as, as with many of the places that we report from nowadays, they are online, they're on social media. So, so I've, I've, there was uh, quite a bit of, uh, you know, of response from Yemenis, more so though Yemenis in America. So the Yemeni expatriate community here, a lot of them had reached out um, and you know, wanted to, to, to discuss the reports and, and they were sharing these and, and that, was, that was really important to me and something that I had actually forgotten about really as a reporter. Um, but the people who you'll see 
profile, the, the, the families that are most poorest, I mean, they, are, they have no connectivity. Um, and, and in fact, we've found it extremely difficult to get back in touch with them. You know, I've had my fixers trying to find my Mona's family, her brothers. Her brother was the only one with a cell phone and it's been disconnected. So a lot of these people come from extremely rural areas. They just come to the town for a day or two as much as they can afford it to get treatment for the kid and then leave immediately. So, um, so that's been a bit, a bit challenging. And do you want to just say a few words, and then, of course, we'll move on to Roger, about the impact of the piece and whether was it what you had hoped and um, what you wanted to have happen when you made this piece of journalism? Well, you know, I mean, you hope to prevent a famine, you hope to save millions of lives, you hope to end war, but uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully that's sort of a longer process. But um, I think ultimately all we can really hope for as journalists is to spark really important conversations and when it comes to Yemen, document war crimes and potential war crimes. I think that has been very important. Um, I have been pleased with how the pieces have sparked conversations that are very important in places like Capitol Hill. Um, I think there's only so much journalism in this case is gonna be able to achieve because of the, the, the larger picture here with in terms of US involvement, in terms of Saudi relations with the White House. I mean, these are, these are things that are beyond our control. But what we, all we can really hope to do as journalists is to fairly and you know, with as much integrity as we can report this and continue to report it over and over. Um, so that has been helpful. The other impact that I'm particularly happy with has been other journalists going in. So that, that's been, it's been great to see. I mean, the Washington Post and the New York Times and the BBC and CBS have all been in since these reports came out. And I, and I hope that, that my reports helped them sort of. Your reports and your 10 fingers and 10 toes that you came out with, right? <laughs> They were very persuasive, I'm sure. Um, Raja, let's turn to you. Raja Razek is a, a CNN producer. She, she was a senior producer in Beirut for four years, also in Abu Dhabi, London, and in Atlanta, which is where actually she grew up, having been born in Jerusalem. So she's had about 10 years of experience reporting from the Middle East in many different places. This piece also won a Polk, and you've previously won, I think, a Peabody for your reporting from Syria. Wonderful achievement. So if we can, um, Janice, look at this clip. A man addressing an unseen crowd. Big strong boys for farm work, he says. 400. 700. 700. 700. 800. The numbers roll in. These men are sold for 1,200 Libyan pounds, $400 a piece. You are watching an auction of human beings. Another man, claiming to be a buyer, off camera, someone asks, what happened to the ones from Niger? Sold off, he's told. CNN was sent this footage by contact. After months of working, we were able to verify the authenticity of what you see here. We decided to travel to Libya to try and see for ourselves. We're now in Tripoli and we're starting to get a little bit more of a sense of how this all works. Our contacts are telling us that there are one to two of these auctions every month and that there is one happening in the next few hours. So we're gonna head out of town and see if we can get some sort of access to it. For the safety of our contacts, we have agreed not to divulge the location of this auction, but the town we're driving to isn't the only one. Night falls. We travel through nondescript suburban neighborhoods, pretending to look for a missing person. Eventually, we stop outside a house like any other. adjust our secret cameras and wait. Finally, it's time to move. We're ushered into one of two auctions happening on this same night. Crouched at the back of the yard, a floodlight obscuring much of the scene. 
One by one, men are brought out as the bidding begins. 400. 500. 550. 600. 650. 700. Very quickly, it's over. We ask if we can speak to the men. The auctioneer, seen here, refuses. We ask again if we can speak to them, if we can help them. No, he says. The auction's over, we're told. And we're asked to leave. That was over very quickly. We walked in. And as soon as we walked in, the men started covering their faces. But they clearly wanted to finish what they were doing. And they kept bringing out what they kept referring to in Arabic as al buda the merchandise. All in all, they admitted to us that there were 12 Nigerians that were sold in front of us. And I... I honestly don't know what to say. That was probably one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen. Yeah, that's one of the most unbelievable things we've ever seen, right? Did you ever think you would witness a slave auction, literally? It's an extraordinary piece of reporting that you and Nima Al-Bagir, the on-camera personality, accomplished. Um, maybe you can tell us about how you did that, because of course, a very risky venture to go straight to the source in Libya, uh, itself a country in turmoil where security is elusive. How did you go about planning for the trip and assessing the risk that you were about to take? Um, a couple of years before we went to do this particular piece, um, Nama was reporting on the migrants leaving from Libya to go to Europe, and mainly we were trying to do reports from Beirut on Syrian migrants trying to get to Europe. So we were covering separately different ends of it. And during that time, she met someone that told her they were sold and that they're selling people in Libya. So this was two years previous to this. Around that same time, it might have been a year and a half, or, I was doing a story with another reporter in Libya on the migrants trying to get to Europe and how they get on the boats. And so I pretended I was a Syrian migrant that's trying to get to Europe. So we had some contacts and we spoke with a smuggler about trying to get on a boat and we secretly filmed then on the iPhone. And it was just, crazy to me because the way they treat it like such a business and it was very organized and to them at the time they felt like Syrians had more money to pay so it all felt like they were pitching what they could do for me so I could tell my other Syrian friends to go to them to get on the boat. Um, we got a tour of the warehouse where they keep the migrants and it was just packed. The conditions were appalling. You just went through trash to get to it. And so we did that story, and um, Nama and I are very good friends, and we would talk about it. And you know, fast forward a year and a half, two years later, Nama was on maternity leave. I had just left CNN to freelance. I was with them full time, and she said, I really want to do this story in Libya. Um, remember when the guy told me that they're selling people? And during that time, I think the Atlantic wrote a story on that. Some other organizations have written that people are saying they're being sold. Um, so she said, I remember when you went into the warehouse, how can we? And so it started from there. Um, I spent a long time in Libya even before that, during the revolution, I covered the Arab Spring. So fortunately, I had a big network of contacts. So had I not had that, it wouldn't have been as easy to do that. So um, it's, it started there, basically. And then it was planning, how do we try and show what's going on? And how can you say a little bit more about the logistics of that? You had an actual panic button that you could press, <laughs> which was going to activate what kind of services to save you in a very bad situation? Yeah, well, uh, 
Fortunately, we had two, two secret cameras, so we carried purses and we had um, a secret camera in each one of them. And because of where we were, we couldn't have a regular security person traveling with us, so we got local security. And then we had another team of security back about you know 30 minutes away from where we were. And in Tripoli, we had the, the, the person that was with us. So there was constant contact between three different people. So the panic button would have been for the first set of people that were 30 minutes back, oh, something has happened, and then to go to those people. Um, what they could have done, I guess, is start driving towards where they knew where we were going to be and take it from there. And you went through a process with CNN with legal and Absolutely. standards and yeah. yeah. So it was signed off on. Yeah, and yeah. it had it, it took a lot of work because obviously secret filming, you always have to show why is it necessary. And Nama would have these conversations with legal on, you know, why is it important to show this because there is a you know an interest for the public to know and this is obviously going on. So going through legal and all that process, eventually they approved it and that's when we got the green light. Okay, you can secretly film if you can get there and do that. And, and what about the people, the Libyans that you were working with? You said you didn't want to bring in sort of big brawny white guys as your security. You were operating with local Libyans. Yeah. But what was the risk to them and how much does CNN take that into account? Uh, CNN takes that into account and they take it very seriously. So anytime we work with anybody on the ground, we're, uh, like Jane mentioned, we're constantly checking in with them after the story. We um, talk to them before it happens. And for me personally, uh, working with fixers, it's very important to also explain the risks to them. And one thing I've noticed, uh, you know, for the 10 years that I was working in the Middle East, unfortunately, I don't see enough people explaining the risk in detail to the fixers like we do, like we have it explained to us by our bosses. So it's sometimes assumed because they're local that they know what they're getting into. But I think sometimes we forget that they kind of don't know. Um, they think because they're local they're more protected and it's our job to tell them because you're working on a story with a foreign team, you're actually now a bigger target. And that is something that I know um, Rory Peck Foundation does a lot of work with fixers to try and, and mitigate that and show them. But that is such a small number of people that get selected to listen to that. And I feel like as journalists, and I hope you know, for students that go out there in the field to take that into consideration, that it's also our job to explain as much to them as it is taught to us, because we have an advantage in knowing more about these risks. No question, and anybody who's been a foreign correspondent in my life, myself included, yeah. owes often their lives to their uh, fixtures. However, mm -hmm. um, it's also the case that in many war zones, the foreigners or the people coming from the outside are worth a lot of money, sometimes to people who are very desperate. Yeah. And there are also instances in which people whom you trust turn out to be untrustworthy and people who are kidnapped or have very bad things happen to them because it turned out that their local staff were not who, they, they were desperate. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how do you actually evaluate the people that you're working with and have the confidence that they are not going to betray you? I mean, I think it depends on the situation where you are and how desperate you think people are getting. Um, it's very difficult to evaluate that. I think the. The best thing I've learned, I think it was particularly with Syria, it was the most difficult with all the kidnappings that were going on and um, literally going in as a team and especially a foreign team, you're kind of a big paycheck for a lot of people. So if um, the person you're going in with is not the one that's tipping people off, it could be someone they know that they told. And it's important to remember that some of these people wouldn't be doing it necessarily in their head to hurt you. They're, they're just trying to make money and they don't know what the end result is if you were to be kidnapped. I think um, many people may not have seen that, okay, so if this person is kidnapped here, then they're gonna take them and sell them to ISIS and ISIS is gonna make a video and you know, so on. Um, so after that experience in particular for me as a producer, I started to 
look at everything when we're trying to do our risk planning and not to factor in how well I know someone. I know it's important because these are our sources and we trust them. And I think I can continue to trust them, but I should operate when it comes to the risk part as if I don't know them. So if they were to tell me, we're gonna go in through here, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, I have to look at that as if just any person is telling me that. Right. Because that could actually you know, get me in trouble and we forget you know, some of these people have hungry children. We don't know what's going on in their life. They've witnessed so much suffering that to them, maybe you being kidnapped for a little bit of money and then they assume you'd be released is really not that big of a deal. I mean, quite to them. I mean, these are people that have witnessed children dying, you know, losing limbs. So kind of have to keep that in mind. Right. Can you talk about the impact that this piece had? Because it did. There are six... Libyan traffickers who are now on the UN sanctions list, and you know it created quite an uproar. That must have been, at some level, very satisfying. Yeah, it, it was extraordinary, actually. We didn't expect it. Um, we expected people to be shocked, but we didn't expect that. And I remember after the auction, we went to a detention center shortly after to uh, film the people who don't make it to Europe or who the warehouses have been busted and they take them to detention centers. and. They were in there like a prison, and they were literally almost on top of each other. And the hardest part for us was when we left, we were like, we can't help them, because you can't help just one of them. You have to help all. And I remember, I'm a smoker, <laughs> fortunately, and I had a pack of cigarettes, and I made the mistake of giving one of them the pack. And then it was almost like a riot inside there because they all wanted a cigarette. So imagine that, right? Um, you're doing something very simple, and I was like, oh, man, I'm, I really messed up. I should know better. But you do. You, you feel like, I want to help you, the person I talked to, or I want to help that guy. But you can't help all of them. So you, we left kind of helpless. And I remember a guy that we spoke with said to me, they don't even know my name. It was something that simple that really struck me because we forget, we talk to these people and this is their life. And he's like, no one knows my name here. Like, how am I ever gonna get home? And so to get back and see that reaction and to know that some of the people we've seen actually got to go home because of that reporting is very, very rewarding. I mean, it, it was great. Congratulations, so. yes. Um, I think you both you know, have talked a little bit about the impact on you of doing this reporting. And I think you know, what um, Raja was just talking about, not being able to help one person in the detention camp, you're in, Jane, a, a child, um, a children's hospital in which you cannot help the child in front of you in any meaningful way. What, what, how, how do you deal with that in the moment? It's a good question because most of the time I'm asked about PTSD. I'm asked about danger and fear and the, the sort of horrible effects of that later. But I would say the effects of this are longer lasting. Like PTSD, I mean, obviously people get it in very, very different sort of, sort of uh, degrees. But I find that if, if you get home from something that's been you know, uh, physically traumatizing, uh, if you're just jumpy or, or you, know, you have some symptoms after covering combat reporting, I find that those do fade for me faster than just a sense of sadness. It, it takes um, a lot of resilience and self-care to get over this feeling like, am I helping these people at all? Should I be a nurse? Should I be a water engineer? Should I, you know, am I just a voyeur? So I think those are questions that I try to delay until I get home. But it's very, very difficult because like the people always say, you know, what's the worst part of your job? Is it, you know, trying to keep down a relationship when you travel all the time? Or is it, you know, you know, sleeping out of a tent in, you know, Syria or the rough conditions? But it's not. It's it's whenever you're in a refugee camp in Iraq and and people hear that there's a there's a Westerner, a foreigner here, so they take their sick children to you because they presume you're a doctor. And you have to look someone in the eye and say, I'm a journalist, I've, I'm actually here just to hear your story. That is really, really hard. Yes. But um, the only way to deal with it is to basically have a sense of faith in journalism and a sense of faith that 
you know, telling stories and, and it, it, it is important. It's a very long and slow way of contributing something, but, but it is important. But it's, I think you have to allow yourself to feel a sense of delayed sadness afterwards. Mm. Is that what you experienced, Roger? How do you, how do you process it and how do you keep going to the next story? I think it's different for different people. And um, I was actually just listening to Nema speaking somewhere else and she said it the best because someone explained it to her is, what's interesting is each person's trauma is different. So what Jane could be traumatic for her may for some reason not be for me. It could be something simpler for me that I found to be traumatic or, or vice versa. So I think trying, knowing that is probably key so it's not like, oh, I just saw that, I should be fine. It's like, no, you go on what isn't fine. And then you take care of yourself that way rather than assuming, okay, if, if I see 10 dead bodies, then that's my trauma. It's like, maybe that's not my trauma. Maybe it's something less than that or more so. So um, understanding what affects you and only you would know that and deal, taking the steps to deal with that. And I think fortunately, um, we're in a time where people are more open to mental illnesses in general. People are more outspoken about the issues they face, where just even six years ago, it wasn't like that. So luckily, not just in journalism, but in everything. It's no longer a weakness or a, a disability that you, you are not dealing. It could be circumstantial, it could be situational for you. And the openness of that as a society, I think, is going to make it so much easier on journalists when they go out there and come back and say, I don't feel good. And that's OK. And I think you're, uh, you know, we're starting to see that more amongst like war reporters. Mm -hmm. Like, There's a lot less machismo. There's yeah. a lot less like super hard drinking and like yes. the sort of stereotypes. I do think war reporters talk to each other more. Yes. There's less of like a fear of talking about it. I think people yeah. are a lot more uh, enlightened. No, that's true, because I used to hear people would say stuff like, well, it doesn't affect me. And I'm like, I think that's just kind of strange, because, you know, <laughs> it should affect you uh, if you're human. But I was younger, and so when they would say that, I would be like, oh, OK. Well, yeah, that stuff doesn't bother me. And it's like, maybe I don't know enough, but I think it should. And um, yeah, so I, it has changed a lot, and I've noticed how people talk about it differently. Well, it's is no that because longer the, the thing. profession is more female? Is that part of what you're saying, Jane? Maybe not the whole story, but I, part I of it? imagine there has to be an impact of female foreign correspondents. We were the, you know, for better or worse, us women, we are the storytellers. We are the sharers. We communicate with one another. I do think we share uh, the impact of, of what we're going through a bit better sometimes than our male colleagues. But I also think it's just a reflection of the society that we're coming from, where you know people don't expect there to be no impact from experiencing so much trauma. And we are more aware of how much of a, an emotional sponge we are. Um, I think also journalists nowadays, we're, we, we, we process afterwards a bit more. You have to process in chunks. You can't just wait until, you know, when I, I, when I was coming up through the industry in my, in my 20s, I mean, I could see older journalists who couldn't, who couldn't look you in the eye without checking for exits, who, you know, who needed an exit seat in a restaurant in Manhattan. So I didn't want to be like that. So you, know, you don't try to, try to repress things that are, that are there. Yes. Well, I think Sarah Stillman yesterday at The New Yorker said something very interesting about being, um, as, a, as a woman correspondent, consistently underestimated by the people she was talking to and how actually very useful that was. And I can imagine that what you both did to get these stories m might have been easier for you because you were female, because you were being underestimated. Yeah. Is at that times, fair to say? At times, in terms of access, it can be. Um, at airports, when you're going through immigration, that's usually a tough time. I think uh, it can be helpful to be a younger female, especially. Like Sometimes uh, you can use a certain degree of chauvinism against those who are using it, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Reverse weaponization or something? Yeah. Something sure. like that. Do you have, a, I want to open it up to the audience for questions, but I also want to just ask you a final thing. What, what advice would you have for anybody in this room who might be interested in following in your footsteps? 
how do you do, how do you, how do you get into this line of work? How do you become you? Oh. <laughs> um, obviously being passionate and just, I took every opportunity that people gave me when I first started and that was whether it be like fixing lights for people. I didn't even know that much about lighting and I was doing lighting for a while and then I was doing filming and then I was doing producing and just do what you want to do and, and make sure you take on as many opportunities as possible because I felt like I learned a lot from those things, even though they weren't directly in what I was interested in, um, being on a shoot for a commercial or um, a series help me understand certain things when I'm out there doing my job. And I think prepping for that is very important. But I think ultimately, because we're talking about reporting internationally, for me, when I, when I was living overseas, I would see so many reporters that have voiced to me that this is the area where they'd like to work in and have made it their life, but didn't learn the language. And that's why I'm so impressed you learned the language. And I was like, you know, it's fine to go somewhere for two years, a two-year stint, or maybe three, or even you end up being there five and you didn't learn the language. But if you've decided this is the place where you want to work, the stories that you want to tell, I think learning the language is a must. Because if we had a, a reporter who speaks Arabic and is reporting in Washington, DC on American politics and didn't speak the language and said, my passion is American politics and I want to be here for another 20 years. It's important for you, even though you'll have people translating for you, because you will learn so many other things, as Jane probably knows, that someone can't translate that to you. You want to be able to hear it yourself, to understand, and there's nothing wrong with not knowing the language, but if you make that where you want to be and where you want to work, I think it's important and it's extraordinary how many don't. Sadly, I, well, not sadly, but I do think a reality for graduates is going to be freelance journalism. Um, you know, entry level jobs don't necessarily lead to the foreign correspondency positions or the foreign reporting positions that everybody wants. There's a lot of, of, of opportunity to do freelance international reporting. And the, the best advice that a lot of young people come to me and ask me you know, what, what they should do, because a lot of my career has been freelance. And I always say, like, try to go to untold stories. You know, it's, it's really fun to live in Beirut. And it's really, you know, there's obviously major international news in places like Baghdad. But everyone's covered there. So the, the most, the, so I think the most practical advice can be go somewhere where you can tell a story that you know, the networks or the major newspapers, they might want something from there once in a while, but they're not going to invest the time and uh, people and money in sending someone there. So it'll be lonely, and it'll probably be pretty austere. Um, but I would say be mobile and go, like, this is where the rewards will be. And also the rewards for you as a journalist to be telling stories that are untold, you know, covering places. I'm not gonna name them because they're dangerous and I don't want anybody to like think that I'm encouraging them to graduate and like go away there. But you know, stories that are not covered so much, like take for instance, Sri Lanka, um, you know, obviously a huge news story uh, at the moment, but relatively uncovered area since the end of the, of the war against the Tamil Tigers there. So th these are places that young graduates, I would encourage to look at, uh, at reporting from, or places like the Philippines or, or, uh, you know, or other, other stories that are, that are important, but, um, that, but that you, know, you won't be competing with all the staff correspondents there. It's so interesting to have this panel right after the one we just said, isn't it? Because that was a panel about the story that's on the front pages every single day that has so much journalistic resources thrown at it all the time, and with good reason. And this is a panel about places that have so few journalistic resources thrown at them. And I think somebody used the phrase the slow accretion of truth in the last panel about like why does this even matter? You know, we didn't get Trump out of office, whatever. Um, but we're at least slowly acquiring the truth. And then you think about somebody trying to go, as Jane did, to Sana'a, to North Yemen, to Rebel Hold. How, how are we going to slowly accrete the truth 
about the Saudi bombing campaign and about the famine in Yemen when it's so hard to get in there. And so many few, so fewer resources are being devoted to these stories. It's a fascinating juxtaposition of the different possibilities in our profession today. Did anybody have any questions that they wanted to pose to these two amazing reporters? Please raise your hand. Yes. There's a woman over here. First of all, um, Jane and Raja, thank you for that amazing, amazing work. My name is Maria Martin. I'm an independent uh, producer, reporter, and journalism trainer based in uh, Central America in Guatemala. And I'm wondering from, and I always compare my situation with the situation of Guatemalan women trying to do journalism. So can you speak about women trying to do journalism in Yemen or other places in, in the Middle East from your question. perspective? Interesting question. Um, I, I, I'm going to presume you mean like foreign journalists going in, or do you mean no, I'm talking Yemeni about journalists? Yemeni journalists. Yeah. I think I'm for, gonna... well, on the whole, Yemeni journalists have suffered the most in this war. They're persecuted by literally every fighting group there is, um, not least of all the Houthis themselves. Um, so many journalists have been, have been pushed out into exile. Before the war, there were, uh, there, there were uh, plenty of Yemeni journalists on the ground. There was quite a vibrant scene there, and you know, international news organizations could turn to Yemeni journalists. But from a societal perspective and a cultural perspective, very few of them were women to begin with. And what we see during any war is, I mean, I've never covered a war where women's rights haven't taken a back seat or, or quite, a, it's quite a remarkable step back, um, other than perhaps Afghanistan, but that's sort of debatable. So uh, I, I, I know uh, Yemeni female journalists, have many of, many, there's, there are several brilliant Yemeni female journalists that are sort of not based in Yemen anymore, but that work in and out of New York and DC, and they can come in and out and who are great experts. But in terms of women on the ground who work and live there, I think that has become untenable for many of them. I agree. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm curious because, Jane, you were talking about uh, experience and um, cultural competency and just uh, language, learning the language. But there's just a trend by editors that you can't stay in a place too long. And this is a totally self serving question. <laughs> what do you, how do you push back on that? That, uh, you know, <laughs> I do have the experience and I should be here. You know, it's just two, three years and then you're out to another place. How do you push back on that from editors? I don't know if you, have you had that at CNN too? Um, I, I personally haven't had that, but yeah, I, I mean like any job, sometimes you have to go where they um, ask you to go, but I, at the time I was referencing the people that make a choice to stay, so even if they go work with another company to stay in the region to tell these stories. As far as pushback, I think it's the, a lot of times for me, what I noticed is the quality of the work you put out. So ultimately, if you become an asset to the company, and not only will they want you there, there'll be other people that want you there as well. So if they say, well, we don't want you here anymore, and you're telling great stories, you can say, well, there's someone else that's going to hire me to stay here and do that. And that seems to be the best way to deal with it. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, um, that's my experience. Maybe it sort of depends on your bureau. When I was a foreign correspondent, I was always living in these horrible communist countries where nobody, they were happy to have me stay there forever. <laughs> Even the Paris bureau chief, you get ousted a little faster, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Liliana Michelena. I'm a Peruvian uh, reporter currently working here. And I have been a, a foreign correspondent in Brazil before. I wanted to ask you about, like, what do you, what's your perspective on foreign reporters 
that sometimes like uh, when they go and report somewhere, they can do great reporting work, but when they write about it or when they publish, sometimes it, it's very evident that they're coming from like pre-acquired assumptions about the country and the people and the culture that they're writing about. How do you how do you avoid that? Like I'm very much I'm Latin American, so I'm very much about like all about Latin Americans trying to tell their stories too, not just letting foreign correspondents come there. But how do you avoid falling in that trap? Or what would you advise to be it American reporters going in there or or reporters from there who want to bring their stories out so as to not having like the same old stories from international reporting that come from this view that like that that always starts with what they think is the most exotic thing about this country. I think that's a really important question because it's a really important discussion in the industry, in particular with magazine length uh, broadcast reporting. I think you know the most important thing for me personally is to push back against any trend towards writing the script before you've even really gone. You know. Um, and I try, when I'm pitching a story, to make sure that that is not the case, that this is not the three acts and how we're going to do it and what we're going to say, and then this person is going to cry here, and then we're going to do this. No, no, like, it has to, you have to be willing to be working with editors and bosses who are willing to, to, to take the risk of sending you in um, with uh, a, from a mindset as a journalist. I'm going to go in and take a look and see what we can get, and, and it's not a fishing expedition, but it, I'm going in with an open mind and I'm going to actually listen to the people that I'm interviewing. I am not going to wait for the soundbite that I needed and then grab it and go. Um, this is a philosophical difference between some journalists. I think that what you're getting at is those who have already decided what the story is before they get on the plane. I'm being a little harsh on them because not everybody can get, a, get the story commissioned without giving us more solid look at it, but it, it's a philosophical difference between journalism and between television content. And it's really important uh, distinction, I think, in, in, our, uh, in this day and age. And like I've said, I think the best way to approach it is to have an idea of what elements you'd like to get, but when you're in there, be thinking like a journalist, asking questions because you actually want to know the answer to, and you are listening, and you are coming up, you're forming the story whilst you're there, not before you've gone. I think, I think yeah, I, for me as a producer, I work with a lot of uh, different foreign correspondents and obviously being Palestinian American, I have the privilege of having grown up in the United States, but also understanding the Middle East. So working there, I found the best thing to deal with it is sometimes they enlighten me to certain things, not to always assume that they're coming in with a certain perspective and that they don't understand. Um, in many cases, there are certain things they're looking at for a specific reason, and we have to remember that is who the network is, what their audience is, because we all do that. So it depends. Who are you writing for? It's still, at the end of the day, you're still catering to an audience. that you, So you have to remember, this matters to me because of this. What matters to them? And that's what I loved. Like, teamwork because I can tell them why that's very cliche but they can tell me that's why that works in this context and is going to get more attention for the story than what I think is going to get attention and somewhere you find that happy medium that makes it really beautiful work because you're coming in not assuming that they don't know enough but also giving them information but learning from them, because we forget we have our own biases. is what we assume they want to know. Um, so they, they, they have a lot to add as well. Please join me in thanking two remarkable journalists.